This is Suburban On Air and Cohen in the City. Here is Mike Cohen. Well, I'm here at Beit HaLochem. Uh, eight Israel uh, veterans had a uh, big event uh, last night. Uh, we can say where it was now. It was at the Hever Kadisha. It was, you know, we're keeping these things secret for obvious reasons. Uh, and Aaron Bors is with me here. He was one of the keynote speakers, and he's got an amazing story. And Jeffrey Bernstein, uh, who is on the executive for Beit HaLochem, uh, aid for Israel veterans. Jeff, why don't you first tell me what this event was all about, why you had it. Well, um, unfortunately, we have disabled veterans from Israel. Uh, prior to October 7, 50,000, uh, with an average of 300 to 350 new clients coming in every year. Since October 7, uh, we've had 8,000 new clients with an anticipated 7,000 more uh, to go. And, and it's, a, it's a really a horrific number if you think about it and so that's that's why we were here uh, we raised a, a lot of money for Beit HaLochem who have four state-of-the-art centers in Israel rehabilitating um, rehabilitating different types of injuries um, not only physical injuries like that of Aaron but also psychological injuries especially PTSD the demands are they're overwhelming um, so it's an incredible organization. It's the, the, the organization officially mandated by the State of Israel to take care mm -hmm. of wounded vets. I remember writing about this event from the Suburban last year, and we all know the role Israel vets, but this is a young vet. You're, how old are you, Aaron? Well, I'm, uh, I'm 34, but I probably look like a child. You, well, and but you were, you're like, you're in reserve because you, you made Aliyah from, you lived uh, from New York, you made Aliyah correct. many years ago. You, you served your initial duty, right? Sure. So when I was 19, I moved to Israel. I was in active service in Givati for two years. And ever since, I've been in the reserves. So it's about 12 years of being a reservist. Yeah. Uh, ready at a moment's notice to drop everything and hold defensive positions, enter Gaza in this case, uh, do training exercises. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, speaking my unit. Of a, and speaking of a moment's notice, the terrible tragedy, the Hamas massacre occurred on October 7th. How soon after were you called up to duty? Uh, we were notified a few hours into the event that would, we would be getting uh, called up. It was official at 6 a.m. on October 8th, um, but my commander had already made the calls and rounds and made sure that people were around um, uh, during that time. So, I mean, I don't know where to start with you. I've been watching your videos. You really are a hero. You're injured right now. You were in the throes. You were in Gaza. Uh, what happened? You went into Gaza. What did you see? What did you do? And how did you get injured? Um, so we went in on October 30th. Actually, very unconventional that reservists are part of the first wave uh, in a war. Mm -hmm. Usually, you know, in 2014, in Operation Protective Edge, reservists were on the border protecting the kibbutzim. And in this case, they actually needed reservists in Gaza to complete the military objectives that they had. So we went in on October 30th. Uh, what did I see? I saw, <laughs> you know, the apocalypse. I mean, every, you know, it's the upside down of what we know in Western civilization. Everything is converted for the purposes of terrorism. Um, you know, we were in a terror playground, essentially. Uh, it looks like residential areas. It looks like houses. But when you go in, sure enough, there's tunnel entrances. There's weapons depots. Um, in 19 of the 20 houses I entered, we found uh, connections to terrorism, radicalization, so posters of martyrs, pictures of little kids holding AK-47s, munitions in a children's bedroom's closet. Uh, in one of the houses, there was just a tunnel entrance. It was actually a decoy for, wow. uh, yeah, for a tunnel entrance. Uh, and so you start to see firsthand how this would be, of course, obstructive to trying to foster any type of peace with um, a Palestinian faction. And um, unfortunately for me, as someone who is you know, pro or, or pro-peace you know, uh, uh, by nature, um, you know, part of that hope was deflated there. Um, the way I got injured is we go house by house, that's part of urban combat. Uh, we have to sleep in those houses, we have to overtake those houses, and that's where Hamas unfortunately hides. Uh, they also hide in schools, mosques, and, uh, and hospitals. 
we were ambushed out of an UNRWA school. Uh, this was November 14th, so UNRWA is complicit in everything that Hamas does in the Gaza Strip. It's just one of the organizations that's under the umbrella of Hamas. And at the time, we, we left this infrastructure intact because we don't want to destroy schools. We don't want to destroy mosques, hospitals, etc. Uh, so we were too exposed while we were crossing. My officer was targeted. That's what they do to try to cause chaos. And they shot him and my comms person. These are, again, my brothers, people I've known for years, people I spend an inordinate amount of time with. Um, I saw this whole thing happen. I was at the entrance to the house at that time. Uh, I took off my bag, started to shoot towards the Hamas squad that was shooting at us from the school with AK-47s. Um, basically, there was a firefight after two to three minutes. I ran out to my officer to try to save his life. I, I saw that he was in critical condition. I didn't know, um, you know to what degree. Uh, when I got to him, I lifted him up. He was very heavy. He had his bag, his vest. And as I was pulling him towards the house, after a few feet, the same sniper that shot him was able to shoot me in, wow. my, in my leg. Um, I crawled back to the house. I managed to survive. Um, while I was crawling, I actually got shot also in my left leg Jeez. and uh, had bullets that were flying, hitting rocks that oh went gosh. into my side and my lower back. So I was bleeding out of four places, critically injured. Our paramedic thought that I wouldn't make it, um, and thank God he was wrong. Uh, 669 came, best search and rescue in the world, got us out in a Hummer, helicopter, and uh, I've been, I was at Shiva Medical Center for five months. Mm -hmm. I, know I was only released a, a month ago now. Um, and then I got on a plane and started doing, doing PR, good, you know, spreading the good word, spreading truth about Israel because there's a lot of misunderstanding information. And excuse yeah. my French, there's a lot of uh, uh, bullshit out there yeah. uh, relating to this story. So, yeah. uh, uh, stories coming out of Gaza. So, uh, that's it. Now I'm here and, and uh, proud to be in Montreal. And this is, sorry, Mike. No, that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. This is one. This is one individual. Right. One. Yeah. One individual. You can mm. imagine mm. how many stories, how much suffering, how much pain. So to answer your question again before, that's why we're here. We're here for yes. him and we're here for every single other person who literally put their life on the line to defend the state of Israel, which mm -hmm. is comprised of Jewish people and non-Jewish people all proud citizens tonight la last night at the event we have two non-jews who belong to Beit HaLochem right one is Druze one has ancestry from Russia um, these are not Jewish people they love the state of Israel they love their country right their, their grandparents came their parents live in Israel and this is the misconception around the world is they think that Israel is this Jewish full state they don't realize that 20% yeah. of it is not Jewish and it's an incredible place, but that's why we're here. We're here for him yeah. and everyone else who unfortunately got injured so that we can walk around these streets proud and free. Well, you, you took the words out of my mouth. You answered the questions very well. So Aaron, we hear all over the world, anti-Semitism, worse than ever, and everyone is criticizing Israel. Every country is saying, just get out of Rafa, leave them alone, have a ceasefire but you're telling us that Israel's doing the right thing, that they have to keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, obviously having, you know, I'm a human being. I have friends in, in Gaza. I have, uh, you know, I know the, what these families go through. I was five months in a hospital. People were in and out all the time. Young kids, 19, 20 year olds. Uh, it's hard to say keep going when you know that keep going means more wounded, more uh, KIAs. And, uh, and that's, that's a tough pill to swallow, obviously. But no good country, no good government, no good people can stand by as civilians are trapped, kept held hostage in, uh, in Gaza, and an abandoned ship. Um, we have to stay the course. We have to keep sailing. It's hard for everybody. It's hard on the economy. It's hard on people's lives. It's hard on people in the north. It's hard on people in the south, people in the center. But we have to keep going. Um, so, of course, you know, there, it's complicated. Um, of course, tears will be shed and blood will be spilled. But we have to stay in Gaza. We have to keep the mission alive and hope that we can rescue as many of the hostages uh, uh, as we can, uh, dead or alive. Unfortunately, uh, many, you know, uh, uh, dead. But I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we can, we can get miraculous stories out of Rafah, out of Gaza, uh, by continuing the mission. The reservists were protesting before the war. Uh, it looked like they weren't going to stand by the prime minister. They weren't going to serve. Um, he's very unpopular right now all over the world, even in Israel. Yet, 
of course, that massacre happened, and everyone, everyone stood up and went, went to war. Yeah, the country's bigger than its government. Uh, despite people being upset uh, with what's going on in government, it doesn't matter if Mr. Potato Head was our prime minister, people would stand up and fight. Israelis are a resilient breed. Uh, we don't leave our civilians behind. It doesn't matter who's at the helm. It matters uh, that we bring as many uh, of our civilians home alive. Um, and I know I can tell you, you know, our unit had a 130% um, attendance rate. So uh, what's called a Tzav Shmone, it's a conscripted service. People show up uh, to base who were called up. And we had uh, over, you know, uh, um, an abundance, essentially, of soldiers show up that at one point my commander was telling people, listen, we, we, we can't, we don't need you. Um, so that's actually how, you know, people were talking about, oh, yeah, they're not going to show up. Or, oh, Israel's, uh, there's fatigue and soldiers don't want to be a part of this. That's nonsense. Um, 100 to 30 to 160 percent attendance rates across all combat units. Um, so that just goes to show you that even more people that don't need to fight are willing to suit up and put their lives at risk to bring home the hostages. Jeff, final final word. Uh, I think if people didn't know what Bet El uh, did before and why it's so crucial, they do, and certainly the people who showed up last night in Montreal do now. Yeah, they certainly do, and. and you know, this is not a new organization, Mike, no. and, and so the organization raises close to $20 million a year. It's based out of Toronto. It's Beit HaLochem Canada. We're, we're trying to elevate the organization in Montreal, make it more known. Certainly last night was a resounding success, over a million dollars raised. Incredible. Okay, it's an incredible amount, over like probably 600 people attended. Um, a, lot, a lot of people are not attending events. They're scared. We, we had, a, you know secure event and and we had a, an incredible turnout and um we're just very proud of our vets and we're here to support them and and we will never leave them um for the rest of their lives uh once you join Beit HaLochem you're you're in the family for life and it's not only the injured vet it's their family as well which is a very important concept so I'd like to leave with that that it's not just that injured vet it's the whole family unit okay kids wives grandparents yeah okay etc cetera, etc cetera. so um thank you for giving us this opportunity mike and you know thank you well for, i'm honored for i'm honored i'm honored to meet aaron and i want to thank doug mayoff who's actually doing it all he's even a photographer and cameraman right now he did a great <laughs> job and he's he's certainly someone who's been contacting me consistently about this organization and i get a lot of calls but this one last year was important more important this year so all the best thank you guys and good luck thank you thank you all right thank you